welcome everybody uh, to our guest speaker event with Marshall Brain. Yay! Yay. Um, my name is Nick Freeman. I'm chair of the Secular Student Alliance here at State, and it is my pleasure to host all of you here. Um, the Secular Student Alliance is an affiliate of the National Secular Student Alliance, um, as well as an on-campus uh, affiliate of the Center for Inquiry. Um, both are 501c3 educational nonprofits. And uh, we strive to uh, foster a community here for uh, non-religious students and non-theists. Um, our mission statement uh, says that we promote democracy, secularism, um, scientific and critical inquiry, and human-based ethics. And we have weekly meetings in this building at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesdays um, and 3.15, so just downstairs and down the hall. Um, we have weekly discussion meetings. John will tell you about a few. Um, and we encourage you to get engaged. Um, our Facebook page and our website is up there. That's the best way um, to stay involved and to be in the know on all the cool stuff we have going on. And I believe that is all of the things we have to tell you. Um, please give a warm welcome to tonight's feature, featured speaker, Mr. Marshall Brain. Mm -hmm. super formal today, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions or start discussions or whatever, that'd be great. Um, I'll tell you how I come to be here today. I uh, started talking about uh, God and religion maybe 10 years ago with a site called Why Won't God Heal Amputees? So that was version one, and then that spun out to be another site called GodIsImaginary.com. That was version two. Then I tried my hand at videos, and that was a series called GII Video, which is, I don't know, maybe 15 million views on that channel or something like that. That was version three. And then I took a rest, and a publisher wrote several years ago and said, hey, would you like to do something like this in book form? And so there was a book coming out in January called How God Works. And its purpose, uh, as version four, is to take another shot at the, at the idea and, in essence, try to give people a framework that would allow them to prove to themselves that God is imaginary. So take everything I've learned from the first three versions and put it together in a new book that would make it possible for a person to, to know with certainty that God is imaginary be able to talk to other people about that if we wanted to, and so on. So what I'd like to do today is take a little slice of that book and talk to you about a couple of the techniques that are used in it, and also the framework that it tries to use to set up how we could talk about that. And uh, that's why, like, if you have feedback or anything, that'd be great. And I would appreciate comments, clarifications, whatever. So. Here's some of the things we're going to talk about. So the basic question, is God real or imaginary? Can we prove that anything is imaginary? Because there's a lot of discussion about that not being possible. Talk about what is God? Because in order to have any kind of, of uh, conversation, we have to know what we're talking about. And God can be a very squishy thing sometimes. Talk about a couple of tests that we can use to talk about the realness or imaginariness, and then a couple of conclusions. So this is the, the land we live in. So we're in America. About 75% of Americans uh, will openly talk about themselves being Christian. That is uh, higher in the South. So in North Carolina, the percentage goes even higher. But on average, it's 75%. And about half of Americans believe that the Bible is literally true, which to me is an amazing statistic. Uh, but that has been shown in several different polls. And in again, in North Carolina, it can go higher. In some states, like Mississippi, it, it can go quite a bit higher. So this question, is God real or imaginary? And then how can we know that? with some 
with certainty, not like we sort of think God might be imaginary, but to actually know it. How do we get at that kind of problem? The, the core discipline we're going to use is critical thinking. If you look it up in Merriam-Webster, it's disciplined thinking that's clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. So if we apply critical thinking to the question of is God real or imaginary, we can start to answer that question. So we first have to establish if we can prove that anything is imaginary. So you'll hear a lot about absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and uh, various lines of thinking along that direction. So do humans ever prove that anything is imaginary? And it turns out that we do do it a lot in something called clinical trials. So if you are a company and you have a medicine, you need to know whether the medicine is real or not. So if I have this bottle of medicine and I make some kind of positive claim about it, then we can test we can see if that's true. So if I say, when taken as directed, this medicine will cause arthritis sufferers to experience less pain for four hours. That's a claim. That claim we can test, and drug companies do those kinds of tests you know, thousands of times a year in the United States, and they need to know definitively, is that claim true or false? Because we don't want to sell a drug if it's not doing what people say it does. So one thing we have to guard against is the placebo effect. So there's this weird thing about drugs, um, like in this bottle there's some little, um, there's some small white pills. Okay, this is an aspirin tablet. There's some cooler looking orange pills. This is ibuprofen. But a funny thing about human beings is that if we give people any pill, and it can contain sugar, whatever, there is a probability that just the act of giving it to them will make them feel better. That effect is something we don't really understand. We, we know it has something to do with the power of suggestion, but some studies, the placebo effect can go as high as 30 or 40 percent. And it's all in people's heads. That's the part we don't completely understand. So another thing about the placebo effect is that the cooler I make the pill look, the better the placebo effect works. And if I inject you instead of giving you a pill, the placebo effect goes even higher, presumably because the assumption is that an injection would be more more medical, maybe, or more efficacious than, than a pill. There's there's a lot of uh, understanding around the fact that the more the procedure feels like something complicated or medical, the more placebo effect you get out of it. So what you're doing in a, in a uh, clinical trial is you're doing double blind testing and you're looking to see if I take two groups of people and I give one of them sugar pills or a sugar water injection and I give others actual medicine, they're both going to have a placebo effect. We know that. You're just trying to figure out if the real medicine causes more of an effect than the placebo effect. If they both come out the same, then you know that the medicine isn't working. It's not doing any better than the placebo effect would have done. And to do double blind testing, you have to have all the patients be blinded. We have to have the administrators be blinded. We have to have completely randomized groups. We have to go to a tremendous amount of trouble. But if we do that, we can actually prove whether a drug works or not. And that's how we decide whether drugs should go to market. We do these double blind, really high precision, complicated trials. And we can prove if something is real or imaginary in terms of a drug's efficacy or a procedure's efficacy and know if it's real that it'll work when we give it to people. So this is one example of how we prove that something is real or imaginary. So the second way is to look at something that we've all probably experienced in our society, and that's Santa Claus and his effect. So 
out of curiosity, are there any of us here who believe that Santa Claus is real? Probably not. Um, in general, the large majority of adults in America believe that Santa Claus is imaginary. Are any of us agnostic about Santa Claus? Like, do we say to ourselves, I don't know if Santa exists or not. Uh, he could, but I don't have enough data to be sure about it. Okay, so none of us are agnostic about it either. So we are certain that Santa Claus is imaginary. There's not really a lot of difference between that and a lot of other things, uh, and especially like God. So why do we know with certainty that Santa Claus is imaginary? What is it that causes the certainty? So if you could take a minute, just, um, just find a neighbor or two neighbors, whatever, and just ask each other, how do you know that Santa Claus is imaginary, and where do you think that certainty comes from in your own head? Just take a minute and talk. <coughs> What's one reason? Like, how do we know it was certainty? Why do we have no question in our minds that Santa is a man? Yes. Uh, we, we can track where in individual people's imaginations it came from throughout history. Excellent. All right. So, where is the main place Santa came from? Like the current American cultural? Yeah, our Santa. Came from a lot of different places, but mostly okay. Saint Nick, I'd say. Saint Nick. Part of it was "Twas the Night Before Christmas." Mm -hmm. I think it was published in the 1820s. Yeah. Super popular poem. Uh, published initially in a magazine and then spread all over the place, and it established all the the big things about Santa, like the sleigh and the reindeer and the pipe and the chimney and the sack of toys and all that stuff came from that poem and its gigantic reverberating uh, popularity all through history. And then I heard someone mention Rudolph. Rudolph came, I believe in the 1930s, a department store published a pamphlet. So there was a year when Rudolph did not exist. And then this pamphlet came out and was handed out to uh, the kids coming to visit Santa. And then Rudolph did exist in our popular culture, and the, you know, the song by Bing Crosby, I think is the guy who sang the song about Rudolph, and you know, the TV shows, and all this stuff happened, but Rudolph definitely did not exist one day, and the next day he did. So this is one avenue. We know Santa is a fabrication, and we can point right to the exact place where he came from. What's another way we could know that Santa is he doesn't comport with our understanding of reality. <laughs> a lot of things violate physics and logic and yeah, experience. Yeah. Right. So you can say he contradicts reality, and whenever we have a contradiction, that is usually a good sign. Yeah. Uh, there's no physical or visible proof. That, yeah. Right. No physical proof. All right. And so I'm going to, like, these two especially kind of link into this. There are a set of attributes or things that we know from the definition of Santa. And these are four of the most popular. He lives at the North Pole, you know, with his workshop and his elves and all that stuff. He climbs down chimneys. He brings toys to all the good girls and boys. He has a flying sleigh and some reindeer. These are all things that are part of the dogma of Santa, part of the literature of Santa. I forgot to mention all the Coca-Cola images of Santa that were published in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century. Hey. So all of this stuff is part of the definition of Santa. And we can go through this one by one and say, well, there is no workshop at the North Pole, and no elves, and, and so on, and we can see that no one climbs down the chimney in our house, and we can look at what happens to children who live in poverty. No one brings them big bags full of toys that would match the toys received by rich kids, for example. This is impossible because it conflicts with 
physics and you've seen the studies, like the engineering studies where Santa would have to fly at the speed of light or whatever. So like all of the attributes, hey, all of the attributes of Santa, we can just go through them and one by one we can say, no, this is definitely false. This definitely doesn't happen. This isn't happening. This, and by knocking down all the attributes of Santa, we can say, I know with certainty that this being defined this way doesn't exist. So from a critical thinking standpoint, we look at evidence. We gather evidence, we process it, we look at it with an open mind, and we find out that none of the attributes are true, and we conclude that Santa is imaginary. Now what if we took that same approach and we applied it to God? That is one of the big chunks of the book, How God Works. So we would have to come up with the definition of God, which is not so easy on planet Earth. Uh, we've got a lot of religions. If we pick one religion, we have a whole bunch of sects. Inside of each sect, we have individual people who all believe slightly different things. But if we were to focus on the Christian God, which is the majority God on the planet, and if we were to look for commonality among all the sects, for example, we look at dictionary definitions, we look at things like the Apostles' Creed, we read the Bible, we can come up with a set of attributes that just about everybody can agree on, and these are them. So this is kind of a definition of God. Out straight out of the dictionary definition is God is omnipotent and omniscient. He's perfect and he doesn't lie. He's all loving, good, moral, uh, you know, in some cases can be your best friend and so on, and that's this part where he has relationships with people. Definitely answers prayers. That's a huge part of God's definition, and probably the part we see out in public the most often. God uh, wrote or inspired the Bible, depending on who you're talking to. He incarnated himself as Jesus the central part of Christianity, so everybody gets this. He created the universe and the earth, and he deals with souls and manages two places called heaven and hell that, that are places for souls to dwell in and so on. These are all attributes that about 2 billion people on the planet can sign up for. There's about 2.1 billion Christians in the world uh, we saw there's 75% of the people in the United States, which comes out to somewhere around 200 million adults in the United States. I mean, these, two, these are big numbers of people will sign up and say, these are the attributes of God. So what if we just started taking those attributes and looking at them one by one, just like we did with Santa, and see how they hold up to scrutiny? And the first one we might talk about is, does God answer prayers? So you know, I mentioned, I wrote the website called Why Won't God Heal Amputees. That is a big part of that site is understanding why God won't answer prayers by amputees to have their limbs restored. Now that's one avenue of trying to understand how prayer works. Um, in the book, this, is, this takes six chapters to just look at prayer from all these different angles. But... One thing we can do here is we can look at this definition. This is, the, again, the dictionary definition of prayer. This comes from a, from a French word. The root is to ask or to request. So to speak to God, especially in order to give thanks or to ask for something. Like this is one of those places where the dictionary definition is right on target. Because this is why people pray. They're either being grateful or they need something. They need, you know, a disease healed, or they need more money in their pocket, or they need their spouse to cooperate, or whatever it is they need. They have something they're wanting, and so they pray to God about it. So, just like we do with a drug trial, we should be able to do a prayer trial, right? We should be able to read and follow the label directions for prayer, and understand whether prayer works or not based on the same criteria we would use for a drug trial. So, 
There's lots of verses in the Bible about prayer, and you probably have seen most of them. So here is one. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now this is a cool statement. Nothing will be impossible for you. If you have a modality that allows nothing to be impossible for you, that's fantastic. That's better than any drug, right? Because you can do a lot more stuff if nothing will be impossible for you. Here's another one. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So this one says you have to have faith as small as mustard seed. This one says you have to believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. But this next one's even better. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, that's awesome because that's straight out of the Bible, which means it's a direct quote from Jesus, who is supposed to be an incarnated version of God. And it says, if you can ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So, if you've read that, and you're a normal human being, what's the very first thing you might do? Pray for, like, anything, right? Like, that is a pretty broad statement. So I might pray, hey, uh, Jesus, I'm asking in your name, can you put $10,000 on the desk right here? And we know that that doesn't happen, right? Because there is something wrong with the label directions here. There is something that doesn't work about this verse. And so what happens in people's minds, they know this doesn't work, so now they have to create a bunch of rationalizations and excuses and reasonings and so on to try to figure out why this doesn't work, but we should be able to do it just like a drug trial. And we know that, that doesn't work. We know that people who have amputations don't get healed no matter how much they pray for it. And that's true of kids with Down syndrome, and that's true of people with cleft palates. And, you know, there's a million things. You can pray all you want, and nothing's going to happen. So, if we were to test those claims, we would find that they don't work at all. The, the placebo effect can be accounted for, but there is never anything above placebo effect. So, we could do an experiment in this class if we wanted to. Um, do you still have coins in your pocket? Like, do people still have coins or anything like that? Is that even possible? <laughs> Maybe yeah, there's apps that put coins. <laughs> Do you need one? We have come. We got one. We got one. You need one? Coin. Got one. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a plastic. We need ten. <laughs> ten coins. Ten. Ten coins. Uh, well, I need you. Oh, I don't know if I have ten coins. I, mean, I can roll the D ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm play a penny. So. Got two more pennies. Two more pennies. Okay, hand these to hand these to your neighbors. Okay. All right. How many coins do we have amongst us? See, we should be able to prank one coins, one. right? One should appear. But you have one. Okay. So out of us, we have maybe six coins. I think we have six. Amazingly. Oh look! He's loaded. Can you hand some of those to your neighbors? Where's Jesus? All right. So let's say we have 10, and let's say we were to try this. We say to ourselves, or we, or we pray, you know, Jesus, we're praying in your name to flip these coins and have all of them land heads. You know, could that happen? Yes. <coughs> like, this isn't even, like, hard with only 10 coins in the room, but go ahead and flip them, and let's see what we get. All right, get Got a tail, so I don't think that's it. Alright, so how many heads do we get? Cast them out. We've got the heretic. You got two heads? I got a tails. Got a head. Heads. 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 Four. Okay. How many tails do we get? One, two, three. Okay, so we got three. Tails and foreheads, which is pretty much exactly what we would expect, right? Like, that's how coins work. Um, so, we, we come to the conclusion that prayer doesn't work. So, 
why does anybody believe it? And one reason we know is because of superstition. And the other reason we know is because of confirmation bias. So confirmation <coughs> bias affects a lot of superstitions. And it works something like, you know, if I say to you, Friday the 13th is a bad day. You've never heard anything about Friday the 13th, but I introduce this idea to you. And you say, wow, really, I don't believe you. So I say, it's true. Watch. On Friday the 13th, keep track of everything bad that happens to you. And so if you take a piece of paper and you write down everything bad that happens to you on Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th looks really bad because you've gone and done what's called confirmation bias. You've only tracked the bad stuff and you've ignored all the good stuff that happened. So if you were gonna do a, you know, a scientific kind of study about this, you would look on Friday the 13th and you'd track everything good and bad that happened to you and you'd compare, and then you'd compare that to Friday or Thursday the 12th and Saturday the 14th and Friday the 9th, the 20th, and, uh, and you'd find that there's nothing that happens on Friday the 13th. And yet, millions and millions of people believe that Friday the 13th has a problem because of superstitions driven by confirmation bias. And that same effect happens around prayer. People look at only the, the times that prayer works, they ignore all the times it doesn't work, and that gives them a false impression that prayer works. So the way around that is to do giant, double-blind, real studies. And this is one that was the biggest one to date that was done in 2006 by um, a, a well-known group called Templeton. They spent $2.4 million to answer the question, does prayer work to help people recover, in this case, from heart surgery? So they did it across 1,800 patients. They divided them into three groups. One got prayed for and knew about it. One group of 600 people got prayed for and they knew they were being prayed for. One group got prayed for but they didn't know it. And the third group got no prayers. And they did this rigorously under double blind conditions. And what they found is that pretty much every group had the same effect from this study, except that the group that knew they were being prayed for did worse. And that's a really interesting study because that's a reverse placebo effect, which you wouldn't expect. And there's been a lot of speculation on why that happened. And one idea is that when you are told people are praying for you, it causes stress. You feel like you have to get better because you know, everybody's praying for you. And so that stress caused the people to do worse than they would have done if we had just left them alone. But you know, all the studies we've done, if they're valid studies and they're done with proper methodologies, they all show the same thing. There is no effect from prayer. Yeah. Um, thinking about it, I would think the reverse to actually be true because I know when you get prayed for for something, and I'm talking from past experience, it takes this load off of you, which takes away the stress that you needed to motivate you to do something in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so we do better when we're under stress. That that's interesting. Okay, that is quite possible. There, you know, I don't think anybody's done the follow-up study to figure out what exactly went wrong. But we know from a lot of studies like this that even though a huge number of people believe that medical prayers have an effect. That is strictly a superstition, and it's driven by confirmation bias. So we also know it because of this. If we ask to heal amputees, that never works. And it turns out that if we pray for anything that's impossible, we know that that doesn't work. The reason why we know it is because that's what impossible means, right? It's like part of the dictionary definition. So. If we know it's impossible, then obviously prayer about it isn't going to work, or that it becomes possible. So here are the two situations. If we pray for something that's possible, then it's going to happen at exactly the statistical rate we would expect, whether we pray or not. And if we pray, pray for something that's impossible, like healing an amputee, nothing ever happens. And this is how we know that 
prayer is a superstition, that it doesn't have any effect in the real world. And you can do, you can come at it from dozens of angles, and all the angles produce the same data. So we can use these scientific techniques and prove that prayer is a superstition. And rational people can see this and understand it. But why do people who are religious still believe in prayer? And that's because there's a whole bunch of these little mental derailments that all work together to cause prayer to seem like it works if you don't ever take the time to think about it. So confirmation bias is one that we talked about. The placebo effect is another one. There are superstitions, the regression fallacy, post hoc, the power suggestion, group think, double think, all these things. It's not like there's one thing that's driving the superstition. There's a whole bunch of mental derailments that drive it, and that's why it's such a powerful force, why so many people believe that prayer works even though it doesn't, because all these things mix together to give the impression that prayer does work if you don't use critical thinking. So this one, double think, to me is one of the most important ones that, that drives belief in religion in general, and double think is defined as the ability to hold two contradictory ideas in your mind simultaneously and believe both of them. So my favorite example is to have someone say, God must be hidden, God must remain hidden, or it'll take away faith, and then five minutes later say, well, God wrote the Bible and he incarnated himself and he answers prayers and he has relationships with people. Like those are completely contradictory thoughts. You can't hide while you incarnate yourself. That's impossible. So double think, if you think about Christianity, there's dozens of these total uh, contradictory statements in people's heads simultaneously. And if you can get at those and show them to people and help them understand that they can't have both sides simultaneously in their head, it can go a long way for helping people to recover from religion because they don't realize it's happening. If you ever listen to talk radio, you hear this all the time where the talk radio person is talking about something and then five minutes later completely contradicts himself and that somehow is okay in talk radio and in religion. But in the real world, in, you know, in the world of rational people, it doesn't work at all. You can't have both. And if you root that out and help people see that they get one or the other, then religion loses a lot of its power, in my experience. Not always, but a lot of times. So here's another example. Why is this story, Noah's Ark, why is it so powerful in our culture. Why do so many people believe that that story is literally true? How can they believe that? Like if you just read the, the Genesis 7 account of what happened with Noah's Ark, it's impossible that anybody would believe this, right? Because it's obviously a myth. Everything about it says myth. And we can look for, again, all the attributes of Noah's Ark and just knock them down. And we know this is a myth. So how do people hold on to it? And part of that's just cultural momentum. But the other part is that this gets segmented off and even incredibly smart people simply never think about it. They never take the time to say to themselves, is this story true or not? They, were, they learned it at age four or five and they accepted it and they never reanalyzed it. So we do know that it's pure mythology, but any critical thinker can say that if it were real, it would necessarily leave behind genetic evidence, because all the species would have collapsed to a single breeding pair, archaeological evidence, like the Great Pyramid would have been underwater for a year, uh, geological evidence, all kinds of geological evidence, ice cores would have to show up the, the flood, because the Bible said it happened 4,300 years ago, in the year 2,300 BCE, this giant six mile deep flood happened and then uh, dissipated and that would have to show up in the ice cores from Antarctica, but it doesn't. So this is how we know, again, that this 
event, or this event is imaginary without any question. So that same thing is true of any kind of God we look at. If there were a God or a set of gods, they would necessarily have to leave behind a tremendous amount of evidence, but none of that evidence is happening in our world. So one of the favorite things, I think, is this relationship with God idea. Let's say we were to believe that people have relationships with God, that they can talk to God and God will answer their questions, give them advice. Uh, in 2012, there were like seven Republican presidential candidates who all said that God had spoken to them and so on. So if we had this relationship with God, what would it look like? And the first thing it would look like is that the people who had a relationship with God would have access to omniscience and they would be able to know things that nobody else knows. They would be able to message pass to each other. So let's say Nick's a Christian and I'm a Christian I could say to God, hey, God, tell Nick this fun fact. Like, I need him to go get uh, milk and bread at the grocery store when he comes back from work. There's no reason why that kind of message passing wouldn't work, like, because both of us could talk to God. There's a famous experiment where uh, a person of great reputation in the atheist community says to a person, here's an envelope with a piece of paper in it, ask God to tell you what's on that piece of paper, which should be possible if you're talking to an omniscient God. And this message passing kind of stuff works. There'd also be uniformity of belief. If people were actually hearing from a real God, we wouldn't have a thousand sects of Christianity and we wouldn't have a whole bunch of different religions because they'd all be hearing the same voice and it would say the same thing to all of them. And then most interestingly, we wouldn't need priests or pastors or any of these other people because God could just talk to people and they would hear him and that would be the end of it. There would be no need for human representation. So again, there should be logical side effects if there were actual relationships happening. And so we know that these relationships are either hallucinations or they're being fabricated most likely fabrication in the case of the presidential candidate. Like, you know, if you have six other people who say they're talking to God and you're not, you start to look like kind of a piker compared to the competition. You know, like God isn't talking to you. So you would just have to make something up. So if we go through all the attributes of God and look at them one by one, we look at prayer and omniscience and relationships and all this stuff, here's the list, we can knock all of these out. And that is essentially what the book helps people to do, is it lets us look at all these different attributes, pull from the real world, from real science, from real critical thinking, from uh, things we experience in our own lives, tests we can do ourselves, all of that. And, and takes all those attributes of God and gets rid of them just like we can get rid of all the attributes of Santa and know that Santa is imaginary. And that way, we know that God is imaginary. So, this is the book. It's coming out in January. There is a website for it. Um, and there's a really, there's a little forum that's on it and uh, there are some people who have asked questions in there and so on. The thing, you know, if you were to go to that website and you had criticism about it or uh, ideas for making it better, I would love to hear thoughts on how to, how to make it a better experience. Also, the thing that would help the book the most right now since it comes out in January is not for you to do anything about the book, but to just link to that, or to tweet that, or somehow get it out to your friends, so that the website becomes known to more people and the book becomes known to more people. That would be the most helpful thing that could happen right now. I'm just starting to do uh, kind of pre-publicity for the book and so on. It's, um, it's being published by a publisher called Sterling, which
which is a subsidiary of Barnes and Noble. So it's it's got a good legitimate publisher behind it, and there will be a lot of publicity that comes from the publisher. But I'm trying to support it as well because I think it's a fun book. I know millions of people have read GodIsImaginary.com and Why Won't God Heal Amputees.com. This is just the next iteration of that. Thank you very much.